Okay, so Sharon, now, listen, this is important. Do you remember last week, take yourself back, the end of last week's episode, we talked about doing a jingle. Have you done one? Well, I've put one together, but it's not finished yet. So what we're going to do is, I've got the, the SHA band in the studio again <laughs> today, because mm. I didn't pay them last week. And they are going to do a new version of the jingle that I wrote after you said let's write a jingle so i just threw one together because it's what i used to do and i thought well that will be quite a giggle to do that hilarious so you're gonna be playing the triangle <gasps> i don't know if i know how to tune a triangle oh don't worry we'll do the hard bits what's gonna happen is we're gonna play it through and then at the very end i'm gonna cue you now there's lots of percussion equipment in here so just make sure you don't hit the thing on your left hit the thing on your right okay Okay, a bit nervous. I'm not really a muso. Everybody's nervous the first time. It's completely natural. So just wait for my cue. I'm going to say now, and then you hit the thing on your right. Okay, lads. After two, one, two. If you're feeling rotten, maybe you've forgotten to listen to a tree lady talk. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And this one. Yeah! Okay, well, well done. That was great. Uh, don't worry about it. Everybody gets it wrong the first time. I'm so over it. I'm going to stick to trees. Maybe best. Okay, so uh, getting back to the business in hand, uh, who are we talking to this week? We're speaking to Dr. David Coyle from Clemson University. He's the assistant professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation. He focuses on, on tree health, forest health, and all those invasive species causing such a problem across South Carolina. He's really great at social media, and you can follow him on Twitter or Instagram at Dr. David Coyle. That's C O Y L E. And he posts about tree health and forest health and all things to do with invasive pests. Really well worth a listen. You know, I really enjoyed talking to Dave because it's great to hear about the similarities and differences between the USA and the UK in terms of how we look after our trees. But, but you know, it's also really worrying to hear about how some pests have come over to where they don't naturally belong and causing a real problem. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing Dr. David Coyle, so uh, let's get into it. Hello, this is Tree Lady Talks, and I'm Sharon Durdent-Hollenby. All music and production is by Noel Durdent-Hollenby, and all views expressed by me or the interviewees are entirely personal. And welcome to Dr. David Coyle. Hello, thanks for having me. So you're based in South Carolina. For those of us who haven't been there, what's the ecology like? South Carolina is incredibly diverse. Uh, the whole southeastern U.S. is one of the most diverse regions in the world. In South Carolina, I like to think of it as having sort of three different zones. You've got the coastal zone, the coastal plain. Uh, this is obviously low, flat, very sandy soil. You know, it's where the ocean used to be way back when. Uh, and it's got very diverse vegetation, very diverse, uh, you know, flora, fauna. Uh, the tree canopy especially is it's a lot of different pines, both for production, but also just landscape. Uh, many, many flowering trees, palms grow there. Uh, so it's got all sorts of stuff. Oaks are super common. And then as you move inland, sort of the middle third stripe of the state, if you will, is, is what we call the Midlands. Um, and this is where you rise up, the elevation rises up a little bit and the soil becomes a lot more clay. So we have this red dirt, you might've heard of a Georgia red clay. It's basically the same thing. The Piedmont is what stretches kind of all across there. So it's very clay soil, again, dominated by pines, dominated by oaks, especially loblolly pine is our number one commercial tree species, you know, in the state and the region really. And then as you go a little farther up, we have just a little bit of the Appalachian Mountains that come through the very sort of northwestern part of the state. And, you know, some of the state actually has some of the mountains, but a lot of times you get foothills and kind of the rolling, rolling type of landscape, right? So you get a lot more, uh, still a lot of pine, but you get a lot of different hardwoods there too. And that's where you actually see a little bit more of that fall leaf color that people love so much. Um, you know, there are some things in the 
in the Midlands, the Piedmont, and the coastal plain that turn colors, but it's nothing like you get in, in the mountains, right? There's just so many different things up there that turn the brilliant reds and yellows and oranges. There's just not as much stuff down on the coast. Now, the trade-off is on the coast. A lot more things stay green year-round. We have a lot of deciduous evergreen things, and again, palm trees. And uh, so, you know, you've got a really wide range of stuff in, in a relatively small state. How fascinating. And in terms of the pests and diseases that we're going to talk about today, in particular um, insect pests, could you just, uh, first of all, just headline what are your main threats at the moment? And then we could talk about individual species in, in detail. Yeah, the main issues we have are pine bark beetles, okay, because mm -hmm. forestry is number, one of our probably number one, number two economy, uh, you know, economic thing there. And so we have pine bark beetles. There's several species. There's ips, which are secondary, mm -hmm. turpentine beetles, which is a dendrochnus. Those are secondary, but we also have the southern pine beetle, which is also dendrochnus, dendrochnus frontalis, and that is a primary tree killer. So that's the one we put a lot of effort in to make sure we're not having big chunks wiped out. Uh, beyond that, we've got invasives like the emerald ash borer. We've got mm. invasives like laurel wilt and the red bay ambrosia beetle. We are, there's all sorts of different defoliators that pop up, you know, they come and go, very cyclical, everything from pine saw flies to various lepidopterans, canker worms, tent caterpillars, all that type of thing. Um, and we're sort of always on the lookout for the next thing, right? Mm. So spotted lanternfly has gotten a lot of attention. That's still a state, two states north of us, but it seems like every year they find it somewhere else. Uh, so we're really watching for that. Those are kind of the main insect issues we have. Disease-wise, we've got, again, some of the pine diseases are our big ones, fusiform rust, heterobasidian root rot. Uh, there's a lot of needle cast, which is a needle fungi that sort of makes the needles turn brown and just kind of fall off. So you get into the urban environment, and again, we've got a really diverse group of trees that gets planted there. So you get all manners of stuff in there, everything from the defoliators to the scales to the wood borers when your trees start getting stressed and all that type of thing. So a little bit of everything. Wow, we're going to come on to why trees get stressed later on, but let's um, let's start with some of the ip species in the pine plantations, and perhaps you could describe to the listener what they look like, what their life cycle is, and how much of a problem it is economically. We have three, we have four species of ips in South Carolina. One of them, ips pinei, we really only find up in the mountains. Uh, the other three, ips avulsus. Ips grandicollis and Ips calligraphus, those are sort of all over the place. They're very common. Uh, they're pretty small. They're, you know, anywhere from a one to three millimeters long, very standard, you know, bark beetle shape. They've got little points on the rear end. So the lame entomology joke is that Ips are a pain in the butt. So yeah. if you need to use that, <laughs> you may. Um, yeah. So, you know, what the way they operate is they go for trees that are already stressed. So if you have a healthy tree, the odds are it's going to fend off ips. You're not going to have a problem. If they are able to get in, the male drills in first and, and carves out a little chamber, a little nuptial chamber. Then he puts a pheromone out, calls in the ladies, and then they mate. And uh, he will mate with multiple different females. They will either make a tunnel uh, going up or down. So that's why when we have ips problems, we say, Look at the gallery under the bark, and if it's shaped like an H or an X or a Y, it'll have a little circle, you know, a little chamber in the middle, and then galleries going up and down. Each gallery is a separate female. So that's how you can tell how successful it was. Um, and then, you know, the adults and larvae feed on the phloem, and they basically kill the tree that way. And then when they're done, they come out and do the same thing over. Uh, those are the Big issue, especially after droughts. We see a lot of ips damage after droughts. We have seen, you know, some some issues. Carolina is prone to some of the hurricanes as well. So, you know, we'll get these things where we get flooding in the fall and then maybe a big drought in the spring, and these trees are just getting yo-yoed back and forth. And they, you know, eventually everything just starts petering out a little bit. And that's when you see a lot of ips activity as well. With the ips activity, is it something that's escalating in the last say a couple of decades or has it always been an issue? I don't know that we have good data on that because IPS are not, you know, IPS outbreaks and IPS activities not really tracked that carefully because it's a, it's mm -hmm. a secondary thing, right? It's not the cause of your problem. Yeah. I would say that IPS activity is pretty correlated with drought 
And since that has been increasing, then yes, I think you are having more Eps activity. And I think there's some groups that have been looking into this, um, and I'm not sure that their stuff is out yet, but you know, Ips can be brought on by drought. It can be brought on by a prescribed fire that got too hot. It can be brought on by, by poor harvesting. If you, if you have harvesters in there trying to do a thinning and they scrape a lot of the trees with their equipment, that can bring Ips in because you've got trees wounded and everything. So And soil compaction as well, I guess, with harvesters. Yeah, I mean, at some point, you know, it's going to stress those, those trees. And, and the soil compaction is interesting because it really depends on where you are in the state, right? Because those sandy soils down by the coast don't compact nearly yeah. as much as you get the really clay stuff in the Piedmont. Like that stuff could turn into a practically rock hard after a little bit of compaction, whereas sandy soil is always going to be sandy, right? So it really just depends. It's not like you can, it's very tough to predict when there will be Ips activity. It just happens when the trees get stressed. So we've, some of the work we're trying to do, we look at, can we predict when and where stress will happen? Because that's a proxy for that Ips damage. Going back to these pine plantations, are they all commercial plantations or of, of monoculture of pines? Or are they a mixture of species? And if so, if they are a mixture of species, does that slow down the prevalence of Ips? Or is it not that simple? Probably not that simple. Um, and it, it spans the full gamut, right? We've got some very commercial plantations that are just rows and rows of nothing but pine. And, and in that case, when our goal is to maximize productivity, they're getting burned on a regular basis. They're, they're, you're using herbicide if you need to to control that competing vegetation. And all you want in there are pine trees growing. So in that case, yeah, it's total monoculture. But a lot of landowners uh, do multi-use forestry. So they might have pines planted in lines, but they're going to let some of the oaks grow in there. So there's some mass for the animals and the wildlife, right? They're going to let some of that other stuff come up to provide cover for, for birds or whatever. Certain pine species, longleaf pine, is much more suited to that type of thing. Uh, you get a lot of quail. Quail hunting is very popular down here. Um, so it really depends on kind of where you are and what your objectives are, because you get, you know, one end of the other and everything in between. In the UK, a lot uh, of more commercial forestry is more geared towards a continuous cover policy and really balancing the needs of wildlife conservation, commercial forestry and recreation. So I, I wonder if that will have a positive outcome for disease outbreak. But as you say, it's not that simple. And there's never enough money in research, is there, to really test these no, things out? There's not. And, you know, we have a very long growing season down here. And, and those pines grow incredibly fast. You know, we can put some of the, the better selections and, and manage them intensively. By age 10 or 11 or 12, we're getting the first thinning where we've got, you know, enough logs to thin out there. And then in some cases by age 23, 24, you can do a clear cut. So you can reach a full harvest rotation almost by the time kids are going to college. You don't have to wait 60, 70, 80 years to get your final harvest. I mean, you can plant stuff and see it happen in your lifetime pretty easily. It just some of this stuff grows so quickly. Some of the longleaf pine that grows a little little slower, but you also get a better product. Mm -hmm. You know, we call it pole timber, you know, make telephone poles out of it. You're, you're not going to get good pole timber in 25 years, but you'll certainly get chip and saw, pulp, saw logs, that type of thing. So it's just, it's a different ball game down here because we've got such a long growing season. So many degree days accumulate because of the heat and humidity. Um, and one of the big headline bad boys is the emerald ash borer. That's caused such devastation, hasn't it? Tell us about um, what it looks like, how it lives and how it's spreading and how it got here in the first place. Well, let's start there, right? So we first discovered it, we, the U.S. first discovered it in 2002 up by Detroit, Michigan, up by the Great Lakes, right? Um, and it was infecting ash. Now, there's a lot more ash when you get up into the, the northern part of the country than there is in the southern part, okay? It's just a much more, especially in the middle part of the country, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. I mean, it's a significant component of the forest composition there, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. Not so much in the southeast, right? You'll find it along river bottoms and here and there. It's, it's not a super common plant. One, one to two percent of our canopy cover in South Carolina is ash, so it's not a huge thing. But so we found it in 2002. 
because some ash were dying there. And we later found out that it had probably been there since the mid 90s, right? So it, it, takes, it takes several years before enough damage happens where somebody gets interested and looks at it. Like, why are all these ash trees dying? You know, at first it could, oh, it could be anything, just some ash trees. But we find out that it's been there a while and then it is just spread. I mean, you've probably seen the maps that has spread over most of Eastern North America in the last 20, 25 years. It's in every state on the East Coast except uh, Mississippi, expanding west. Obviously, it's being slowed down because to get over our Great Plains, which is primarily just big agriculture, there's just not as many trees there. It will spread 12 to 15 miles a year, but most of the way it spreads and makes those big jumps is from human activity. Humans taking firewood somewhere is what it usually is. And a lot of this happened before we really knew that firewood was a big way stuff spread. You know, a tree would die and people would say, well, there's firewood for deer camp or firewood for grandma's place at Thanksgiving for the fire pit or whatever. And they take it there and then maybe they don't burn it all. And then meanwhile, those larvae are inside there. They finish development and they come out the next spring. It is a smallish beetle. It's about a half inch long, bright, bright, bright green. The adults don't do a lot of damage. They just kind of nibble on some leaves, uh, lay an egg on the bark, and then the larvae are what do all the damage. So the, the larvae can be an inch, inch and a half long, and then they, they feed on the phloem. So they end up just, you know, killing the tree that way. They can be extremely voracious feeders and really take a lot of phloem out of an ash tree. So the good news is they only hit fraxinus. The bad news is they hit every Fraximus. So, you know, white ash, green ash, pumpkin ash, blue ash, all of those are susceptible over here. There is some variation, but, you know, long story short, the ash is, is in, a, in a world of hurt. How did it get here in the first place? Does anybody know? Well, I think we'll never know definitively, but it's strongly suspected it got here in dunnage, which is just great big logs that shippers will basically put in the bottom of the boat to balance it. It's rough cut. It's not processed. It's just weight is all it is. And then a lot of times it just gets dumped when you get to the next port, wherever you're going, right? So it just got dumped up there. And I think, you know, there's some of these things are supposed to be destroyed. Who knows if they all always are, right? So that, that's how we think it got here. And then, you know, it was transported in firewood. It was transported in some nursery stock. You know, it can survive in something that's just uh, two and a half, three centimeters in diameter, so it can survive in those. And I think it was transported. Uh, that's how our spot in Colorado happened. Wow. What would be the natural predator? <laughs> well, there's not many natural ones other than very generalist things, you know, like a spider, birds, woodpeckers yeah. really like the larvae. So actually seeing a high woodpecker activity on an ash tree is kind of one of our indicators that, whoa, you better check that out. There's probably EAB in there, right? right. But beyond that, I mean, there's no native specialist on agrilus wood borers. You know, we've got a lot of different agrilus, which is the genus. We've got a lot of different ones here that you hardly ever catch. They're just not that common, right? They impact stressed trees and everything. And they've tried some biocontrol agents from China. They found that are specific to emerald ash borer. They work to varying degrees of success. You know, some of them work better up north where it's colder and others don't work, you know, work a little better as you go south, but there's definitely temperature issues where you can't just take the one that works the best up north and bring it all over because it's too warm down here. So so there's some of those things that, that happen as well. Mm -hmm. It's a tricky one. There's no, there's no realistic way it's ever going to be gone. They're working hard to develop resistant ash selections. You can back cross it with Manchurian ash, which is a, a native, native to China where EAB is from. And so sort of like the American chestnut where you've got one sixteenth Manchurian 15 16th native you can sort of breathe that resistance in there and that's I think that's where the hopes are at this point. Wow it must have had a real impact on the landscape in North America and the ecology as well so is there is a planting in those areas of different species to sort of compensate for their loss or is it on too grand a landscape scale? Too grand a scale I mean you know landowners individual landowners will do something but it's it's all over the place. You know, you drive up to Ohio and you just go through these seas of dead tree carcasses standing there, right? Um, it's pretty depressing to see it. It's really unbelievable. It's, you know, I would argue that EAB is the worst forest health uh, issue of my generation, right? A chestnut blight before me probably, right? There will be something after this, but I think right now Emerald Ash 4 is like the poster child for the worst case scenario. I'm trying to think if there anything good has come out of it, but it seems not. If there is a silver lining, 
It's that our tree injection technologies and capabilities are great now. In the landscape, if you want to save a tree, you inject it with amamectin benzoate or whatever. The technologies and the formulations, the active ingredients that have been developed because of EAB are a real benefit for a lot of different things. I don't think that we would have been this far along without EAB because that's what really pushed all of that stuff to get it done. Well, there's kind of a parallel, isn't there, with the coronavirus vaccine. Um, we're recording this on the 9th of November and at lunchtime in the UK today, they announced some good news about a vaccine that seems to be doing very well. And without the pandemic and the terrible issues that that's caused, but there wouldn't have been such focus on people creating vaccines. So there's always something that good that comes out of it. Really interesting to hear about the STEM injections. It's definitely a way forward. For example, there are some in the UK for Dutch elm disease. I just wonder, the more we learn about trees, the more we understand that they're an incredibly complex structure, which are really a host to so many hundreds of different species of fungi, bacteria and viruses, as well as obviously this insect pest. And I wonder, rather like a strong antibiotic will knock out your gut flora for a while, I wonder if there's any studies on the effect on the tree's gut health, to put it in the layman's terms, whilst using insecticide. We may keep the tree, but does it become a mere woody skeleton with phloem and xylem? Right. I don't, I don't know of any studies that look at that. You know, I think a lot of times, by the time someone has a, we'll call it a yard tree, right? A tree that in their managed landscape. By the time they are to the point where they want to inject it, there is an imminent threat to that tree. The wave of EAB is coming or laurel wilt is the next county over or something. And I, I almost feel like scientifically, yeah, there's a lot of questions we don't know, but from a pure application standpoint, that tree owner doesn't care because they want that tree to stay alive through whatever is coming down the pipe. And if that emamectin benzoate kills their target uh, pest, but also whatever else, hey, the tree looks great. It's still providing those ecosystem services, isn't it? It is. But I'm being awkward here and, and looking at things very holistically in terms of like the tree as a being, but actually the tree survives that. It still can cast useful shade. It can still deal with surface water runoff, mitigate pollution. Yeah, no, I was going to say that the one instance that sticks out is the whole neonicotinoid thing, right? So those were used to treat trees. And if you put those on at the wrong time, that chemical can get into flowers that can then affect bees and pollinators, right? Um, you know, that's that's kind of what started that whole anti-neonic thing a few years back. Well, it was put on a, if I remember right, a basswood tree, a tilia tree up in the, the pack northwest, Oregon maybe, but they put it on at the wrong time. So they had this tree juiced while it was in full flower, right? And so it, to me, part of it gets back to you got to follow the label directions for any pesticide use. The directions are there built on a bunch of science that tells us when is the safest and most appropriate way to apply these things. And when people don't follow that, that's when, when we get in trouble and when we can lose active ingredients because of people's just negligence, either naivety or negligence, one of the two, right? There's definitely collateral damage in some cases. In some cases, it's obvious. All the bees die because they put on the wrong time. In other cases, it might be really, you know, hard to detect, right? Maybe you're changing that, that internal phloem chemistry or something like that. Yeah. A lot of questions there. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, support to do that type of work because, again, from an applied standpoint, you have achieved your goal and you've kept that tree green. And it is still doing all those great ecosystem benefits, right? It's sucking up stormwater, it's producing oxygen, it's giving shade, it's, it's improving property values. So um, that's kind of where we are with that. I'm just exploring ideas and it's good to hear because I know in the States, you really apply a lot of treatments more than we do in the UK, although we are beginning to use more organic treatments, et cetera. You brought up a good point. We apply a lot of pesticides over here. And one of the things I try to do as part of the education is to convince people that a little bit of defoliation is okay. It's okay if leaves have some chew marks in them or if a couple flowers get eaten a little bit. That's, that's okay. That's natural. It does zero harm overall to your, your mature tree. A little bit of a fall webworm, okay, it looks, gro it looks rough because you've got a big web there. All you got to do is just cut it out, right? Or if you've got 
you know, silk moth caterpillars, subcropia or luna moth caterpillars eaten in there. They're going to take some leaves, but if you've got a big mature tree, that's fine. It's totally fine. And it's real difficult to get people to accept that their precious tree is getting eaten, but it's okay, right? It's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that we try. Yeah. Often the best thing we can do is just tell them it is not worth the money to treat for a few little things. You know, and in some cases I've tried to use humor and I've said, look, if you're going to spend a hundred bucks on something that's not going to work, why don't you just give me the hundred and we'll call yeah. it. That way you <laughs> spent the money, you feel good. I know that it truly is going to be fine either way and we can all go home happy. And, you know, no one has given me the money yet, but it, it's just sort of, it sort of proves that point. Like a little bit is okay. It doesn't hurt anything. Right. It seems to be, um, from what I understand, there is more of an appreciation of the perfect image of a tree in somebody's well-manicured garden. It's very much part of their estate. In the UK, we are a little bit more easygoing about the tree being more of a natural being. For example, we have Camaria oridella, the horse chestnut leaf miner here, which you don't have in the States, do you? I don't believe so, Camaria no. oridella. And... Um, so that is a, a, a moth that produces larvae, which I can't believe I'm telling you something about insects. <laughs> How hilarious. This is great. Um, that, will ch that will chomp through the green part of the leaf between the veins, and it creates a very stripy leaf. And it knocks out some of the photosynthetic value of the tree. And so it is slightly reduced in vitality, but it's pretty much uh, an ascetic you know, issue. Yeah. And nobody really minds. I mean, it's a bit sad. They can look a bit ropey, but the householder would not be going to uh, a tree specialist saying, sort this out for me. You know, we have different sorts of standards. So it's interesting to compare the two, isn't it? Yeah. And we've got companies over here that their clients are all high end clients that, that want zero damage on a tree mm. right and they do treatments for things like scales and and leaf miners and i'm just like it's part of our ecology it's a very american thing i think you know and um i know i'm from here but i've you know i've i guess i've seen enough to where that is one of the very american things is is the aesthetics is so important to a lot of people and it has got to look perfect that tree has got to look like it's shaped like a lollipop and it's got to be pristine and green, and every leaf has to be whole. That's not everyone, of course, no, right? No, but, I know. but there certainly are plenty of of people and neighborhoods and areas out there that are are, are just very much they want everything to look, you know. Well, that's perfect. that's lovely that people really care for their trees, isn't it? So let's and uh, they really appreciate the beauty of their trees, um, rather than thinking. Oh, this tree's too big, it needs lopping. That's what people say in this country. They say, yeah. it's too big, therefore it's dangerous and it needs to be lopped to, to make it better. And then we have um, the educational thing here of yeah. saying, trees don't benefit from pruning except in a very few circumstances, you know, for their own sake, for their own structure. Going back to our nasty pests and diseases, Something I wasn't familiar with before, but I, I did a little look on the internet before we spoke today and came across some images of the ambrosia beetle. Tell us what that looks like and what happens to the tree. Oh, the ambrosia beetle. Yeah, so most of the ambrosia beetles we have here in the States are native, right? And they just come to a tree that's already weak. They, they bore into the tree and they're not feeding on the tree itself. They're basically using that tree as a house. So they bore in and they make those... Uh, very typical noodles or toothpicks or frass tubes, you know, it looks like a piece of spaghetti that's sticking out of the tree. I mean, it's incredible. It looks like a, a hairy leg that needs yeah. shaving. I mean, it's, it's worth Googling everybody. And so they burrow in there. The female beetles have these little pockets basically on their shoulders and there's fungal spores in there. And as they're drilling into the tree, the fungus gets on the inside of that, that tunnel and it grows, right? So it grows and then she lays her eggs and the larvae feed on the fungus. So they don't really eat the tree other than female hollowing out gallery. Most of them, again, attracted to weak trees, but you know, whether that's a tree in the, your yard, in the woods, in the side of the road, whatever, if it's weak enough, ambrosia beetles are probably gonna get it. We do have several non-natives that can be bigger problems in nurseries. And then we have the red bay ambrosia beetle, which is our, probably our most impactful ambrosia beetle from China because it carries laurel wilt. And this is a disease that's uh, lethal to everything in the family Lauraceae. So you're looking at the red bay trees, the uh, 
avocado trees, sassafras, and it's just it's just a very aggressive fungus. And you know these beetles go after any healthy live tree uh, in that family. And as the beetle gets in there, the fungus gets in there, starts growing, and it grows rapid. And the tree has such a violent I guess, reaction to it, that it basically kills itself almost, right? So normally when a tree has a wound, it, it tries to cordon that off and sort of compartmentalize, right? Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, the Raphaella fungus for laurel wilt, when that gets in a tree, it's almost like the, tr the tree compartmentalizes itself to death super quickly in trying to like stop stop the whole fungal thing from happening. So it is pretty much lethal. You can, you know, you can prevent it again with tree injections with uh, propiconazole, which is a fungicide. You can, if you've got a prized tree you want to keep going, if you proactively treat that thing, you can, and it works. Uh, not cheap, got to do it every year, but hey, you can keep your tree alive, right? So uh, that's a bad one. And we've seen mortality all the way from all throughout the Southeastern US on the coast and then getting up into the more into our hardwood region, Tennessee, Kentucky, where the sassafras are getting hit. There's a lot of concern that it will make its way through Texas down into Mexico. Uh, Mexico has a very diverse Lauraceae. That's where the world's avocados come from, is Mexico. I always tell people, if you like guacamole, that's where it's made. It's not made in Florida or California. Like you've got a little avocado production there, but Mexico avocados is where it's at. And they've got massive plantations of avocados. And if this ever got down there, it could be devastating to, you know, not just to that component of the food chain, but to communities down there, which all of a sudden will lose the number one thing they do. Yeah, exactly. It has such an economic and social impact, doesn't it? As well as an ecological one. Have you noticed in your career that there's been an increase, um, not only in the number of pests and diseases that are causing a problem, but how each one of those pests and diseases is affecting populations? So more pests and diseases and each one of those creating a bigger picture, or is it fairly stable? I guess I don't think there's any more pests and diseases. I think that our management of everything has changed. And you know, our climate has changed such that mm -hmm. trees are more susceptible now. Yeah. Certainly there's some new invasives, right? But but I do think the big issue is that both in an urban environment and in a in a more natural environment, there's more stresses on trees now than there was before. You know, and I'm talking about the different rain drought cycles. I'm talking about damage from storms, whether it's the tornadoes or derricos that happen in the middle of our country to the hurricanes we have. As you go north, you know, some of the freeze saw cycles get off, right? Where it can, you'll have an early thaw or early freeze and then it warms up. And so these trees have to shut down immediately, but then, oh, do I start, do I start going again? Oh no, now it's cold again. And then same thing in the spring, like it'll get warm and the trees are, you know, the hardwoods like, well, I guess it's time to wake up. Just kidding. It's 30 degrees now, you know, so they're getting yo-yoed back and forth. All that does is stress trees, right? It might not kill them and, and, and it can get written off as like, oh, we had a really funny spring in 2017. But to a tree who's got to just sit in that same place for years, right? Those are, there's a cumulative effect of all these different stresses. And I think that to me is one of the bigger things, you know, so you've got the environmental stress, you've got all the stuff people do, whether it's the pollution, whether it's poor management, uh, whether it's planting the wrong tree on the wrong site, all this stuff works together. In urban environments, trees have a hard time, don't they? There's lack of nutrient recycling often and uh, compacted soils and salt spray and um, pollution. And have you seen how some people plant trees in urban areas? It's embarrassing. Like, it's like we need to do so much more to, 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 to let people know what the right way is to plant a tree. Take the burlap off it, for the love of God, right? Like, dig a hole that's big enough for it. You know, don't cut your roots to fit the hole. You cut, the, make the hole to fit the tree, you know? Couple that with people's expectations. Because I think a lot of people expect a tree to live forever. They, they plant a tree, and they just expect that their grandkids are going to, like, someday have a swing on that. There's a lot of trees that aren't going to live to be 100 years old. Mm -hmm. In some of these places in, in urban areas, if you get 20 years out of a tree, that was a good run. 
And at that point, it's time to swap it out and do something else because it's just going to start dying. Yes. Putting the right tree in the right spot and, you know, especially with what, depending on the space you have. And I know they're working a lot to try to maximize, especially in town, like in, in urban areas where you've got a four foot by four foot meter by meter square. This is where a tree can go. You're not going to put a massive oak in there, you know, when you've only got whatever, 16 cubic feet of soil. And oak's not going to grow there more than a couple of inches in diameter. And I think just getting people to have more realistic expectations of what to do is important. Or maybe even, even better, you know, just to think about how they are planting the trees and, and have linear pits that join up together with other trees. We know that trees don't like to be isolated. Yeah. They want to be with their friends. It's funny because, you know, people will spend hours every weekend tending a flower garden. Yeah. And then they'll plant a tree and ignore it for 30 years. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying you've got to sing to it every weekend, but, it, you know, every year, maybe give it mulch if it needs it, water it if it's a drought. Yeah. Maybe a little fertilizer early on to get it going, right? And, you know, they don't take a lot of effort, but it, it'd be better than ignoring it the minute you plant it. So is there a movement towards using, say, biochar, for example? That's quite a big thing in Europe now, using biochar for all the beneficial properties that that has. There's, there's some, you know, and it, it really depends where you are. Um, I wouldn't say it's a widespread movement, but I think there is some there. I'm also not completely dialed into the arboriculture um, society nationwide. I'm, I'm more involved on a local level. So there's some, some movement for that. I know in general, yes, there is a big push to figure out what can we do to prolong the life of our urban trees. And that's everything from the ones that are already there to what do we plant next and how do we plant it the right way? So there is a, a bigger move. I think people now realize that it takes effort and planning to get what you want out of it. And, and space and good appropriate soil and aftercare. I mean, it's not actually rocket science, but it's a huge educational issue, which brings me on to, you know, one of your, your main roles is really education. So tell us about how you've been reaching people beyond your media industry to educate the public and other professionals. Yeah, it's changed a lot in the last few months, right? Because, you know, prior to <clears throat> prior to March, I was I was on the road a lot. I traveled a lot and we did a lot of in-person workshops and speaking engagements. And obviously that's changed a lot, but I try to be as available as I can and reach out, reach out as many people as I can. And I reach everyone from individual landowners to garden club type groups, to societies, to industry, to municipalities, right? It, it covers a really wide range. My whole goal is just to get people to understand how trees work, how to maximize what they want to do, you know, and one of the first questions I always ask, well, what do you want to do, right? What's your goal? Because it doesn't matter what I say if it's not helping you achieve your goal. I've been doing forest health for over 20 years, and you just use the knowledge you have to help them figure out their goal. And maybe it's, maybe it's a simple, straightforward management thing. Um, a lot of what I do is invasive plant management in the natural areas because that can impact your, your productivity and all that. In the urban areas, it's a lot of what we just talked about, just getting people to think a little more broad picture about that tree in the front yard. Don't let your kid scrape the roots with the lawnmower every week. Put some mulch around it to protect the base so it's not getting hit with the weed eater and everything. It's just a lot of different talking, you know, and I've sort of joked to my wife, all I do for a living is talk, honestly. I read in the off hours and then I talk about stuff. Um, and it's just kind of like coaching people on how to be good tree stewards, right? Tree and forest stewards. And finally, David, what is your dream scenario? I think, you know, a couple things. From the invasive species standpoint, which, which I deal with a lot, we still struggle in this country, in every country, to detect things before they actually get on land. And, you know, if there was a, a goal for me, it would be, we have so much stuff that comes over in those big shipping containers, right? It would be great if there was something like a Tide Pod, right? One of those little soap pockets you could just throw in a container and it would kill whatever invasive species was in there. By the time it got to wherever it was going, by the time it got to the US or to Europe or to Argentina, it would be sterile. If there was that type of thing that everyone could just chuck a Tide Pod into a container before it shipped, and that would eliminate the possibility of invasive species, that would be absolutely amazing. It would also be amazing if they could find some sort of biological control agent that would wipe out some of these non-natives, but specifically them. And like, if there was a virus that hit Emerald Ash Borer, 
that just all of a sudden came and just spread through North America and wiped them out, I think that'd be great. Right now, I'm not I'm not for wiping out EAB in China. I mean, that's where it's from, right? It should be there. That's cool. But as far as over here, the destruction, like if there was something that happened that would just cause widespread elimination of some of these really bad invasives, we spend so much time and so many resources dealing with it. Those efforts and that money could be spent for some really great stuff if we weren't constantly battling these things like Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, laurel wilt. You could use that money for such great things if it wasn't constantly getting sucked up by these big invasive species. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Well, that was, again, another fascinating insight. I mean, poor old ash trees. I mean, they're getting it over here with ash dieback. They're getting it over there with emerald ash borer. I know it's such a terrible situation, and it's all about stringent plant hygiene and regulation. It's so important. I think it's interesting, though, the idea that he came up with in his dream scenario. I mean, is that practical? I have no idea. I'm going to leave that to the experts, but it sounds pretty simple to me. We've got to do something to stop these pests and diseases spreading. Because I know, I mean, I've seen this in Australian immigration, when they, uh, Australian airports. I mean, if you come in with something that's not supposed to be in Australia, you've got no chance of getting it in. These things get in containers, and, and obviously we can't do anything about it. And when they get over there, they just go and do all the damage, and that's the end of that. I know. We absolutely need regulation. We need proper funding for people who check out the regulation. And let's knock this on the head at source. So thank you to David Coyle. And next week, I know we've got a big surprise, haven't we? Yes, next week we've got one of our longer episodes on the Woodland Trust. We're so grateful to the Woodland Trust for sparing us the time so that we can really showcase the huge range of work that they do. It's not just about campaigning, it's about protecting, it's about inspiring and research. Yeah, that's right, I agree. I I think the Woodland Trust is the one organisation that you see all over the media promoting the fantastic things they do. Absolutely, they're great. And so what else is happening? Well, we've been in touch with the Institute of Charter Foresters, which I am making me as Vice President, and we're actually going to be running a series of collaborative podcasts for the Trees, People and Built Environment Fall, which is going to be on the 3rd and 4th of February next year. And so we're hoping to interview some of the keynote speakers and chairs to give you an insight on how they're thinking, their background. So we're going to be starting those at the end of this year, beginning of next. Don't forget to subscribe to Tree Lady Talks. You can find us on SharonHoseGoodAssociates.co.uk and Twitter at the Tree Lady 67 And hopefully we'll see you next time when we may even have another jingle where the Tree Lady might do this. When I'm out on a walk With my tree lady talk And I can tell you I'm in my Green heaven So until next time, it's goodbye from me And it's goodbye from her And it's goodbye from him I've said goodbye from me already Oh, whatever